Hello, and welcome back to the Poetry Podcast with me, Lance Pearson. Program 9. And today, it's nostalgia all the way as we go back to some of the classic poems I enjoyed as a child. And I guess you did too, if you're a post-war baby boomer like me. And if not, I hope you'll enjoy the artistry of these writers as they enter the imagination of a child. I was so lucky to have a mum who loved reading poetry to me. In my world at that time, there were three great poets she read again and again at my insistence. The first was Edward Lear. He's famous, of course, for popularising limericks. But the one I really loved was not a limerick, but The Owl and the Pussycat. It's a love story incorporating song and dance. It cries out to be set to music. As a child, I had an old 78 record of Elton Hayes singing it to the guitar. It's still available on YouTube, but now I prefer a more recent recording by Heidi Swedberg. She was perhaps best known as Susan on Seinfeld, but is now a ukulele instructor and sings the song here, accompanied by two ukuleles. I love the animal noises. The owl and the pussycat went to sea In a beautiful pea-green boat They took some honey and plenty of money Wrapped up in a five-pound note The owl looked up to the stars above And sang to a small guitar Oh, lovely pussy, oh, pussy, my love What a beautiful pussy you are You are, you are Oh, what a beautiful pussy you are They ate with a runcible spoon And hand in hand At the edge of the sand They danced by the light Of the moon The moon, the moon They danced by the light of the And do you know what a runcible spoon is? Edward Lear invented the word himself to mean a spoon that could double up as a fork as well. Inside the broad curve of the spoon, it would have three fork-like prongs to skewer things up. 
There you are. The things you learn on a Lance Pearson Poetry Podcast. Twenty years after Edward Lear was born, there came Charles Lutwidge Dodgson, better known by his pen name of Lewis Carroll. His deathless achievement was Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. They are strewn with intriguing poems for children, and my favourite because of the wonderful nonsense words that spark the imagination, is Jabberwocky. Are you sitting comfortably? Twas Brillig. <laughs> and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the moan wraths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead. And with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, frabjous day, kaloo, kalay! He chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borrow goves, and the moan wraths outgrabe. <laughs> Those words, sheer perfection. And you probably know Humpty Dumpty's explanation of the nonsense words. I'll give you just the first line. Brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon, the time when you begin broiling things for dinner. Slithy means lithe and slimy. Toves are something like badgers. Well, they're something like lizards. And they're something like corkscrews. As Alice comments aptly, they must be very curious creatures. And fifty years after Lewis Carroll, there was A. A. Milne. As well as creating the world-famous Winnie the Pooh for his son Christopher Robin, he wrote two books of children's poems, When We Were Very Young and Now We Are Six. From them comes this great favourite of mine, The King's Breakfast. The King asked the Queen, and the Queen asked the dairymaid, Could we have some butter for the royal slice of bread? The Queen asked the dairymaid. The dairymaid said, Certainly, I'll go and tell the cow. Now, before she goes to bed. The dairy maid she curtsied and went and told the Alderney, Don't forget the butter for the royal slice of bread. The Alderney said sleepily, You'd better tell his majesty that many people nowadays like marmalade instead. The dairy maid said, Fancy! 
and went to Her Majesty. She curtsied to the Queen, and she turned a little red. Excuse me, Your Majesty, for taking off the liberty, but marmalade is tasty if it's very thickly spread. The Queen said, Oh, and went to His Majesty. Talking of the butter for the royal slice of bread, many people think that marmalade is nicer. Would you like to try a little marmalade instead? The king said, Bother! And then he said, Oh, deary me! The king sobbed, Oh, deary me! And went back to bed. Nobody, he whimpered, could call me a fussy man. I only want a little bit of butter for my bread. The queen said, There, there, and went to the dairy maid. The dairy maid said, There, there, and went to the shed. The cow said, There, there, I didn't really mean it. Here's milk for his porringer and butter for his bread. The queen took the butter and brought it to his majesty. The king said, Butter, eh? and bounced out of bed. Nobody, he said, as he kissed her tenderly. Nobody, he said, as he slid down the banisters. Nobody, my darling, could call me a fussy man. But I do like a little bit of butter to my bread. Hey, way, hey, hey! Not only is the whole thing great fun, but those last few lines are for me a wonderful example of how poetry can simply leap into the air and take flight. Well, those three great poets entranced my earliest years. I came later to Walter de la Mer, by now at school and able to read for myself. I didn't devour everything he wrote, but I was totally captivated by his most famous poem, The Listeners. Thomas Hardy said it was possibly the finest poem of the 20th century. Admittedly, Hardy died in 1928, so he could only talk about the first quarter of the century. But I'd like to know what poem since then has been any finer. On one of the guided walks I lead, we look at the house in Twickenham where Delamere lived for the last sixteen years of his life. It is a large, imposing house, and we stand outside the wall under suitably impenetrable trees, and I shout the opening line, Is there anybody there? Fortunately, so far, there never has been anyone, the day someone shouts back, Yes, I'm here, <laughs> my career will be over. I said the poem has captivated me. I have often wondered about its mystery and the questions it poses. Who is the traveller? Who are the listeners? Why are they ghosts? What has happened to them? It proved irresistible. I wrote my own version of the backstory, blending it with my family history. My grandparents lived in the border country, my grandfather from the English side, and my grandmother from the Scots. Their ancestry was tempestuous. If they had met two hundred years earlier, they would have killed each other, not married. And I present the story now as the introduction to this great, great poem. The horse slowed, and turned its head as if scenting trouble. The rider dug his spurs into its sides. This was the thickest part of the forest, no place to linger in the dark. But the horse whinnied in terror. It reared up on its hind legs and tried to turn back the way they'd come. Down, you beast, snarled the rider. What the devil are you doing? But he didn't need the horse to answer. The encounter he had 
dreamed and dreaded for so long, was upon him. Black shapes emerged from the trees. Five, six of them, closing in from every side. W "'What do you want?' he quavered. "'Who are you?' "'We think you know, don't you?' "'Traitor, Douglas,' said one of the shapes. "'The rider felt sweat break out all over. "'No one had called him Douglas since before the time he... "'since he went into exile, travelling the forest tracks, "'criss-crossing the borders, avoiding the raiding parties, "'riding, always furiously riding, but knowing no place as home. "'Traitor, Douglas,' the voice repeated, you didn't think you could escape from us, did you? The horse went deathly still, and the rider could hear his own heart pounding fit to burst. He knew the voice. But, but I thought you were dead, the voice interrupted. Of course we're dead, and our women, our children, our servants... "'slaughtered in our beds because of you and your villainy. "'You sold us to the Scots. "'No, no, it wasn't me. You, "'You paid me well. I kept my word. You, "'You must believe me.' "'No answer came. "'The shape stood stock still, their faces hidden in the dark. "'He couldn't tell what they were thinking, planning. "'It must have been someone else betrayed you,' he blundered on. "'Someone else led the murdering Scots to the hall.' "'Very well,' the voice replied at last. "'We shall put it to the test. "'You will go back to the hall.' "'The horse shook beneath him. "'No, no,' said the rider. I, "'I can never go near that cursed place again.' "'You shall go,' said the voice. "'You have no choice.' If you do not go, we shall come back to take you. But the hall is haunted, he trembled. Of course it is haunted. That is why no one else inhabits it. We have it to ourselves, the whole clan, every generation, back to the strong Solkeld who built it. You must confront them. They will listen to you in their hearts. They will know whether you speak truth or not. But I do, I, I am, I give my word. Then you have nothing to fear. This is your ordeal. You are to knock on the great door three times. If you're innocent, there'll be no answer. After the third knock, you'll be free to return to the world of men. But if you're guilty... They will take you. You will be condemned to slave for them in the hall forever. The bodies formed a barrier across the forest track and began to drive the horse westwards. It walked without any word from the rider. It knew where they were going. First the steep fells and lakes, then the low-lying fields, finally the long hidden drive. The rider hadn't seen it for thirty years, but he knew it better than any of the woods and farms and becks where he'd hidden for so long. Round one last bend, and there it stood. Sorkelt Hall. Half of it ransacked, all abandoned and overgrown, but still standing the central tower and square still complete. He paused, his heart failing him. He would have turned and fled, but the horse stood stubbornly still. It was a trial he had to face. He dismounted and stepped as softly as he could up to the huge oak door. "'Is there anybody there?' said the traveller, knocking on the moonlit door. 
and his horse in the silence champed the grasses of the forest's ferny floor. And a bird flew up out of the turret above the traveller's head, and he smote upon the door again a second time. Is there anybody there? he said. But no one descended to the traveller. No head from the leaf-fringed sill leaned over and looked into his grey eyes, where he stood perplexed and still. But only a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men. Stood thronging the faint moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down to the empty hall, hearkening in an air stirred and shaken by the lonely traveller's call. And he felt in his heart their strangeness, their stillness answering his cry, while his horse moved, cropping the dark turf. Neath the starred and leafy sky, for he suddenly smote on the door, even louder, and lifted his head. Tell them I came, and no one answered. That I kept my word, he said. Never the least stir made the listeners, though every word he spake fell echoing. Through the shadowiness of the still house, from the one man left awake, ay, they heard his foot on the stirrup, and the sound of iron on stone, and how the silence surged softly backward when the plunging. We're gone. But the horse that clattered into Nether Town at break of day was wild-eyed and had no rider. Whoa, spooky! Well, it's almost time to go, but I'd like one more before we finish. We've featured some of the classic children's poems from the nineteenth and early twentieth centuries, but I wouldn't like to give the impression that I only like poems that talk about spake and shillings and porringer, and that I that I don't appreciate what has come after them. They launched. What I think is now a golden age of children's poems and stories, and I'd like to finish with a more recent poem from the second half of the twentieth century. It's by Ian Sorelier, and for reasons that will soon appear, it's called "After Ever Happily," and they both lived happily ever after. The wedding was held in the palace. Laughter rang to the roof as a loosened rafter crashed down and squashed the chamberlain flat. And how the wedding guests chuckled at that! You, with your horny, indelicate hands, who drop your hitches and call them ends. Who cannot afford to buy her a dress? How dare you presume to pinch our princess, miserable woodcutter, uncombed, unwashed? Were the chamberlain's words before he was squashed. Take her," said the queen, who had a soft spot for woodcutters. He's strong and he's handsome. Why not? <laughs> What rot," said the king. But he dare not object. The queen wore the trousers. That's as you'd expect," said the chamberlain, usually meek and inscrutable. 
A princess and a woodcutter. The match is unsuitable. Her dog barked its welcome again and again as they splashed to the palace through puddles of rain. And the princess sighed. Till the end of my life. Darling, said the woodcutter, will you be my wife? He knew all his days he could love no other, so he nursed her to health, with some help from his mother, and lifted her, horribly hurt, from her tumble. A woodcutter, watching, saw the horse stumble. As she rode through the woods, a princess in her prime on a dapple grey horse. And now to finish my rhyme, I'll start it properly. Once upon a time. <laughs> well, that's all for now, folks. You might like to know that the recordings of me reading the poems on this podcast come from my CDs, The Poems We Grew Up With, and Sing In My Mind. Details on our website, thepoetrypodcastwithlancepearson.com. There was one other classic poet in my childhood, and that was Rudyard Kipling. We haven't heard from him today, but next time will be a Kipling fest, as we've had a listener request for one of his poems. <laughs> <laughs> 